From the short form of Professor Cunningham's curriculum vita, we can begin to get a sense of how he spends his time. As the John A. O'Brien Professor Emeritus of Theology at Notre Dame University, he received an undergraduate degree in philosophy in what is today St. Bernard's Institute in Pittsburgh, New York. A licentiate or master's degree in theology at the Gregorian University in Rome, and a second master's in literature and a PhD in humanities at Florida State University. He taught at Florida State for 20 years, from two years before receiving his doctorate there until 1988, and at the University of Notre Dame for 27 years with visiting appointments at eight other institutions including the East Asian Pastoral Institute in Manila and the College of St. Augustine in Johannesburg, South Africa. He has received 14 teaching honors, honorary doctorates, and publication awards, including being the first winner of the now annual Media, Media Legends Award from the University of Notre Dame. He is author, co-author or editor of 24 books, 37 chapters in other people's books, 22 entries in 18 encyclopedias, and 245 entries in two other encyclopedias, all published before 2012, the last year of the curriculum vita that I consulted. He anticipates the publication this year of the two-volume Norton Anthology of World Religions, of which he is the editor. A noteworthy feature of his publishing record is that there are several, sometimes as many as six, editions of some of his books and translations into Korean, Japanese, Portuguese, and Polish. I didn't count the refereed or non-refereed articles, of which there are many. Not to be overlooked are his 10 years of writing the quarterly, and so, sometimes more frequently, book notes column of the periodical Commonweal and his generous service at one time or another on 17 editorial boards. I am tempted to use the affectionate term, the great communicator, to highlight the genius that integrates all of Professor Cunningham's talents Luckily, the critical importance of that particular genius has been highlighted by philosopher-theologian Bernard Lonergan. Lonergan, in his book, Method in Theology, made communications the culmination of his eight functional specialties, research, interpretation, history, dialectic, doctrine, systematics, Lonergan noticed that there is no theological truth to be born without the first seven stages. Nevertheless, without the eighth stage of, of communications, he said, the first seven are in vain, for they fail to mature. Professor Cunningham has greatly facilitated the particularity and beyond the particularity of religious traditions for our time. But perhaps he himself has provided the best description of what he has been about. In his introduction to his classic book, The Catholic Faith, he wrote, the upshot of all this is that the author will treat this subject with prickly love and a kind of cranky fidelity, which is sometimes identified with faith. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Cunningham, who will speak on the holiness of John the 23rd. You can write a lot if you don't have much of a social life. Uh, so. uh, before I begin my prepared text, I would like to do two things. One, I would like to thank Thomas Levergood and the Lumen Christi Institute for inviting me here. I come over as often as possible <clears throat> from South Bend to uh, participate in the rich 
uh, programs that are provided to this community, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is this. Uh, we're going to canonize two popes uh, on Sunday, John the 23rd and uh, John Paul the Second, And I don't think that people recognize how rare it is to canonize a pope. There might be some ecclesiological truth to be uh, thought about in this. We canonized one pope in the 20th century, Pope Pius X. We had no pope canonized in the 19th century, no pope canonized in the 18th century, and only at the end of the 17th century, um, Pius V, the Dominican Pope, was canonized. And then you have to go all the way back to the year 1294 to find another pope that was canonized, and that was Celestine V, whom Dante excoriates as the one who made Il Gran Rifiuto, the Great Refusal, who gave up the papacy after a year bringing uh, to the Sea of Rome um, the hated Boniface VIII, hated by uh, Dante, that is, that great prince of the Pharisees, Dante calls him. So to have two canonizations of popes, one wonders about the holiness of the papacy when the canonizations are so rare, but that's a subject for a different time. So I want to speak today about John the Twenty-Third. It so happened that as a young student of theology at the Gregorian University, I was in St. Peter's Square when the Cardinal Deacon came to the central loggia of the Basilica to announce that the College of Cardinals had elected Cardinal Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, the Patriarch of Venice, as the successor of Pope Pius XII. I remember vividly running over to a news kiosk to get a copy of L'Osservatore Romano to get a biographical profile of the new pope who took the name of John. For us, he was an unknown quantity. To many of us, we didn't know anything about him at all, which is understandable since he had spent most of his priestly life away from the city of Rome. Born into a peasant family in the Lombard village of Sotto il Monte, near Bergamo, way up in the north of Italy, one of 13 children, he entered the seminary when he was 12 years old and was tonsured at the age of 14. He was ordained a priest in 1904, just short of his 24th birthday. His priestly life interrupted by required military service, first as a stretcher bearer when he was a seminarian, and then as a chaplain shortly after his ordination. He was very proud of the fact that he attained the rank of sergeant in the uh, army. But between those two times, he won a scholarship and was able to go to Rome to live at the Collegio Romano and study at the Lateran University. And I thought it was really curious, I'm off my text now, I thought it was really curious to learn that the man who supervised his examinations for the doctorate was a young aristocratic Roman priest named Eugenio Pacelli, who later would become famously Pope Pius XII. Roncalli showed an interest in ecclesiastical history and while he was doing pastoral work uh, for nearly 20 years, he did a lot of research in history. And his research is in the life and times of St. Charles Borromeo, the great reformer uh, of Milan, brought him to the attention of Achille Ratti, who was then the prefect of the Ambrosian Library in Milan, who brought him into the Vatican diplomatic corps 
when Rati was elected pope in 1922. So there were a number of times where there was a kind of a convergence between the life of Roncalli and the papacy. Roncalli served in Bulgaria and then in Greece during the Nazi occupation in that country. In 1944, he was named Nuncio to France, where he had to deal with some French bishops who had been collaborators with the Vichy government. Charles de Gaulle wanted to force more than half the bishops of France to resign because of their collaboration with Vichy. And this didn't seem to sit too well, but in fact, um, Roncalli, with the encouragement of Rome, uh, did manage to force three of the more egregious ones to retire. And after the war, he was handled the prickly question of the priest worker movement. And while Nuncio to France, he also became the first Vatican permanent observer at UNESCO. In 1953, he was named to the College of Cardinals and made Patriarch of Venice. Roncalli bought a return ticket when he went to Rome as part of the conclave that in fact named him as Pope. Now I traced out very briefly this potted biography in order to draw from it to make a very important point. The standard picture in popular parlance is that Pope John was an avuncular son of peasant stock who was pious and loving and earthy, especially when contrasted with the Pope he replaced, the polyglot, austere figure descended from the minor Roman aristocracy, Pope Pius XII. This portrait, or better, this caricature of the so-called good Pope John, who combined shrewdness and piety, was very much in the air in his own lifetime. A Roman taxi driver once remarked to me that every Italian had an uncle just like him. Big, jolly guy would pinch your cheeks and um, so on and so forth. It was a picture also indulged by a few of the College of Cardinals when they elected him Pope, thinking him to be a kind of safe, innocuous placeholder uh, for um, time being. By the way, that same cab driver uh, told me very proudly that he was a member of the Communist Party. And I said, well, you know, uh, Rome has excommunicated any baptized Catholic, any Italian who was a member of the Communist Party. Oh, he says, Pope John doesn't think that. Waving his hand at me. Pope John, he wouldn't think that. Now this populist picture of the Pope would force us to believe that the College of Cardinals would elect such a person to the papacy. The Cardinals as a class tend not to be so naive. What the Cardinals saw, it seems to me, is a churchman who had vast experience dealing with the Orthodox Church, both in Bulgaria and later in Greece, who knew the Muslim world from his days in Turkey. He was also one who had seen up close the terrible cost of conflict in both the world wars. Furthermore, he had been such an aid to persecuted Jews in Eastern Europe that his personal intervention was of sufficient magnitude that the Raoul Wallenberg Foundation compiled three dossiers on his wartime activity and petitioned the Yad Vashem Foundation in uh, Israel to have him inscribed among the righteous of the Gentiles as a resistor to the Shoah. Finally, he was a public scholar, conversant in a number of languages, who proved his pastoral metal in dealing with vexatious church issues during his service to the Holy See in France. His diplomatic service was, had given him first-hand exposure to the world of the Orthodox, as well as an abiding interest in the churches of the East. He had a long-standing interest 
in the relationship between Catholics and Orthodox. And he was ahead of his time in that uh, he was very interested in Christian unity. He knew Cardinal Mercier from Belgium, and Mercier had undertaken for 20 years a dialogue with the Anglican Church in England, the Church of England, uh, despite the fact that Rome was a little suspicious of this at the time. Um, and this was done through a man named Lord Halifax, the so-called Malines conversations that went on. And uh, Pope John, before he became one, was very interested in this endeavor. He also became a good friend of a Belgian Benedictine, Lambert Baudouin, who founded a monastery um, that would have both um, Roman and Eastern Rite monks within it and published a journal which is still published today called Istina, uh, which is uh, devoted to Catholic Orthodox dialogue. It is the case that when he was elected in the fall of 1958, he was a month shy of his 77th birthday. It is also the case that it took 11 ballots to elect him as Pope. And it is probably true that had Archbishop Montini of Milan been a cardinal at the time of the conclave, it is the case that Montini might have been elected instead of Roncalli. In that sense, Roncalli was a sort of placeholder for Montini and an acceptable alternative to the other possible candidate the crusty old Roman hand, the Armenian Cardinal Gregory Agajanian. However, if the college had decided on Roncalli as a safe candidate, different enough from the late Pius XII, they had not counted on his willingness to take his task with alacrity. Shortly after he became Pope, John made an announcement about three initiatives he intended to pursue. One, he was going to call a synod for the Diocese of Rome. There hadn't been one in over 200 years. Two, he was going to revise canon law. And three, he was going to call an ecumenical council. These three deserve a word each. Although the Roman synod was held but universally judged to be of no lasting significance, the fact that John turned his eye to Rome itself was not without significance. After all, the Pope is Pope because he is Bishop of Rome. That's how you become Pope, by being elected Bishop of Rome. And John made it clear that while he was a universal pastor, he would not neglect Rome, his home diocese, while serving in that capacity. In fact, he inaugurated his papacy with a number of pastoral visits outside the Vatican. He went to the local Roman jail called Regina Celi, Queen of Heaven Jail. I've been by it many times, believe me, if that's heaven, we're in big trouble. He went to the children's hospital on the geniculum, Bambino Gesù, and he regularly made pastoral visits to parishes in the city throughout his papacy. On his deathbed, he told his secretary, Loris Capovia, that if the Lord had spared him, his intention was to visit every parish in his diocese, to make a pastoral visit to every parish. Now, secondly, the papal desire to update the code of canon law for the Western Church is interesting since it was less than 50 years old when he was elected Pope. Code of Canon Law was promulgated in 1918. Even though many saw it insufficiently structured for the needs of the church. The old code, 1918 after all, had been drafted and promulgated in the less than salubrious era of the anti-modernism movement. So work was begun on the corpus of Canon Law during John's papacy but would not be brought to completion until the papacy of John Paul II when it was published and took the force of law in the early 1980s. And by the way, this code was only for the Western Church, not for the Eastern Church. There's a separate code for the Eastern Church. 
Finally, of course, John's decision to call an ecumenical council was paramount, the one thing that everybody thinks of when they think of John. There had been talk of a council during the papacy of Pius XII and even earlier because, as is well known, the First Vatican Council ended so abruptly due, the outbreak, due to the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Only the First Vatican Council only uh, spent a, a year or so and then it, it, it had to break up. Now some people argue that after the definition of papal infallibility, there was no need for any more ecumenical councils. If there was a big issue, the Pope could speak infallibly and put an end to it. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road, but that uh, doesn't make an awful lot of sense. What was critical, however, was that John insisted that this council should be strictly of a pastoral nature. It should concern itself with, and this is his phrase, not original to him, aggiornamento, bringing up to date. And it should concern itself primarily with Christian unity. The council would convene during John's papacy, but, it would, but he would die before its work was completed, and that uh, task would be left to his successor, Paul VI, Cardinal Montini. Now, I think that what's really interesting here is the fact that the Second Vatican Council was absolutely singular in this sense. If you look at the two volumes, Tanner's two volumes of the ecumenical councils, every council in the history of the church from Nicaea right up to the present day used extremely precise theological language and it issued at the end of each of its chapters what are called canons, C-A-N-O-N-S, saying this is what's uh, what we hold. If you don't hold this, you're outside the pale of the faith. There are no canons in uh, the Second Vatican Council, no doctrinal uh, uh, issues carefully described, etc. It was pastoral. And the person I think who's written the best on the difference in the rhetorical style is John O'Malley, the Jesuit, who's written a brilliant, uh, two brilliant works on how different styles uh, become received and interpreted in the church. Okay. Everybody with me here? Okay. Now, a pope is not called holy, much less canonized, before, because he performed great ecclesiastical feats, like calling an ecumenical council. Pope is called holy if a pope is notable for his sanctity. And it is John's sanctity that is at the core of these reflections that I wish to engage in now. I went back and checked. Uh, Council of Trent lasted for years, decades. None of the popes that oversaw those things have been canonized. So you don't get canonized for calling a council or whatever. Sanctity is the note. Nobody seems to have put up a placard saying Santo Subito. Remember when John Paul II died, they had these posters up. Santo Subito, let him be a saint, named a saint immediately, Subito. When mourning the death of John in 1963, there was, however, widespread feeling that he was a saint. People of a certain age people like me. We'll remember that year commemorated in millions of tacky ceramic dishes and pictures of the two Johns, John Kennedy and John the 23rd, because they both were assassinated in the same year. You could go in any pious Catholic home uh, and, and find these uh, plates, these kind of tacky plates with John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, who will not be up for canonization anytime <laughs> soon, and uh, Pope uh, John the Twenty-Third. That sentiment about John's holiness seems to have persisted, such that when his body was translated to the main floor of St. Peter's Basilica just a little over a decade ago, judging from the last time I was there, a police officer had to be stationed near the altar to oversee 
the crowds that, who lined up to pray before his grave, buried under one of the basilica side altars. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary to see this long snaking line of people waiting just to go up and kneel down and, and pray at his tomb. A more empirical set of evidence about his interior life has been given to us with the publication of his personal journals, edited and published under the direction of his former sec uh, secretary, Don Loris Capovilla. By the way, Loris Capovilla was made a cardinal a few months ago. He's 92 years old, so it's a kind of a gold watch. Uh, he can't vote in the election, etc. but he's still chugging along at the age of 92. It is an extraordinary volume whose title is The Journey of a Soul. It reproduces a set of journals the Pope kept from the time in 1895 he was 14 years old. He kept these journals throughout his life. He, he used little composition books, cheap composition books called quaderni in Italian, and he would he, he would make spiritual notes in these, and he would go back and refer to them, etc. Uh, they're qu quite extraordinary. Rather rarely striking a high literary note, it is rather a kind of vade mecum of his retreat notes, reflections from his days of recollection that he regularly observed, and notes based on his spiritual reading. To those journals are appended his several last wills and testaments. John, in obedience to law and custom, made those wills when he was named a bishop, when he became Patriarch of Venice, and when he became Pope. The one constant in all those documents is that he was determined to die as he was born a poor man. He was so committed to this end that he told his relatives that part, apart from some memos, uh, mementos, there was nothing in his will of substance for them. He said, you, you folks are doing okay, but you're not going to be enriched over uh, the fact that you have an uncle or a brother who's a pope. In preparation for this presentation, I read carefully the journal, looking for some common threads, and rather than attempt a recapitula recapitulation of the whole, I'd like to mention some major themes that run through the notes that I have noted. They can be summarized under just a couple of headings. Heading number one would be constancy or sameness. All things being equal, the spiritual program of the young Angelo Roncalli set out at the age of 14 when he was tonsured as a cleric daily mass, recitation of the rosary, meditation, spiritual reading, visit to the Blessed Sacrament, were the same practiced practices he utilized some 60 years later as Pope. The only difference was that he added the faithful recitation of the breviary once he undertook that obligation, one ordained to the subdiaconate, replacing his long practice of reciting the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He almost never failed to make an annual retreat of an Ignatian nature. He looked for Jesuit confessors and retreat masters to lead his retreats from his earliest youth. In fact, a goodly mount, amount of his pages in the journal consists of reflections made during those retreats as well as an examination of the ways in which he had progressed or regress from the resolutions he made during those periods of retreat. Roncalli was extremely well read in a number of languages, but apart from the texts of the mass and the liturgy, the breviary, his meditations on scripture, the one constant in his spiritual life over the decades was his persistent reading of the imitation of Christ. Now, again, let me point out something as an old guy. When I was a kid growing up, you might not have a Bible in your house. You know, you got all the Bible you needed from listening to the 
readings at Mass on Sunday, but you sure had a copy of The Imitation of Christ. Every, I have one at home which I got from my bishop at the time I was confirmed, written in there, still have it to this day. A couple of years ago, I decided to put The Imitation of Christ on the syllabus of a course I was teaching at Notre Dame. Students were horrified by the imitation of Christ. And it has a certain stream of anti-intellectualism in it. I would rather experience compunction than to know how to define it. A little slap from Thomas Akempis at all the scholastic theologians in the universities of the day. It's very heavy. It's a monastic text. Uh, it's very heavy on abnegation, self-sacrifice, so on and so forth. It was enormously popular, not only in Catholic circles, but later in reform circles. Uh, they would boulderize, they'd get out all the stuff on the true presence of Christ in book four of the imitation, but otherwise everybody was reading the imitation of Christ, and that was true up until 30 or 40 years ago. Interestingly enough, in his later years, he became a devotee of a writer almost completely unread today, except by people like me, Frederick Faber, the 19th century contemporary of John Henry Newman, who wrote, how put this charitably, somewhat saccharine works of devotion. Um, Faber loved, if you ever go to the Brompton Oratory in London, and he loved kind of Baroque piety and fiddleback vestments and, uh, and 18th century devotions about Our Lady and so on. But um, some of his books were translated either into French or Italian, and Papa Roncalli was reading them. I was also struck that in his later years, he began to read the works of the 19th century controversial priest Antonio Rosmini. Uh, Rosmini was a prophet before his own time. He wrote a book in the middle of the 19th century, Le Cinque Piaghe della Chiesa, The Five Wounds of the Church, which was promptly put on the index because he made such audacious suggestions that the church would be better off if it translated the liturgy from Latin into Italian. So he was in favor of vernacular liturgy and so He was also quite a good philosopher and a devotional writer, faithful Catholic, but uh, not all of his books uh, uh, received three cheers from uh, the Holy Office. Roncalli always preferred to make his retreat according to the Ignatian model, as I said, and not infrequently he would read commentaries on the spiritual exercises while he was making his retreats. Now, not to put too fine a point on it, the resources of John, that John the 23rd drew upon was a standard post-Council of Trent form of pi uh, piety, encouraged at Trent and codified in the Code of Canon Law, and from that piety developed an intense Christological piety a profound devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and an asceticism rooted in Ignatian spirituality. Very great oratorian priest, Giulio Bevilacqua, in a meditation that introduced uh, the journal, uh, John the 23rd's journal, said that the journals of the late Pope seemed to mirror thousands of post-Tridentine books of piety produced over the centuries with their somewhat rigid programs of exercises, three points, um, you know, meditation, and their overemphasis on, uh, on technique. But he goes on to add this, and I think this is quite right. Yet this kind of spirituality produced Pope John. The tree is to be judged by its fruit. Here instead, all is real. The simplicity, the awareness of being a creature, scrupulous moderation and reserve, extreme human sensibility, above all, the will to aspire to the fullness of Christ, unquote. 
It is, in short, a spirituality that nourished all the great saints from the 16th century on that at its best give a vivid alternative to the desiccated state of textbook manuals of theology at the time. His devotional life did not have the advantage of the great spiritual ressourcement that was to flourish after Vatican II. Second kind of theme, I would say, the constancy, and it's somewhat similar, is his sense of fidelity. If the spiritual ground that nourished Pope John was his constant practice of traditional piety, it is his fidelity to his chosen vocation that most impresses me. He chose the path to the priesthood when he was barely in his teens and ended his life in faithful adherence to that path. He was a man of the church, not in the narrow sense of following a career path, but in his determination to serve according to the best of his abilities. His love for Christ and his intense devotion to the Blessed Mother was unimaginable except within the context of the church itself. The rare times when he allowed his voice to be raised in criticism, it was a voice that struck out at those who abused their vocation in the desire for honor or prestige. There is a striking set of paragraphs written while on retreat in France in 1948 when he becomes fascinated by his meditation on the sheer simplicity of figures like Thomas Akempis, the author of The Imitation, St. Francis of Assisi, and preeminently the Jesus of the Gospels. As he read a passage from Gregory the Great, probably from his briefery, who noted that the simplicity of the just man is so often derided, he then adds, John then adds, quote, all the wise acres of the world. I wish I knew the Italian word for wise acre, probably furbo. All the wise acres of the world and all the cunning minds, including those in Vatican diplomacy, cut such a poor figure in the light of the simplicity, grace shed by this great and fundamental doctrine of Jesus and his saints. Later in that same set of notes, he added, I thought this was particularly striking. Any kind of distrust or discourtesy shown to anyone, especially to the humble, the poor, the socially inferior, every destructive or thoughtless criticism makes me writhe with pain. I say nothing but my heart bleeds." Unquote. He goes on to chide himself for not speaking out on such occasion, seeing it as a weakness within himself. It is those rare moments of self-revelation that one detects a key feature of his holiness, his well-disciplined spirit of simplicity. Not simple-mindedness, but simplicity. As the late French Cardinal Feltin of Paris uh, would say of him, his simplicity was ferme non mole. It was strong, not weak. Or better, soft, strong, not soft. He abhorred self-promotion. He feared allowing his appetites to master him. He reacted violently against cruelty. He was determined not to show his promotion to become a platform for enrichment. It is striking that he made a conscious effort not to use his ecclesiastical honors to be an opportunity for his extended family. The one temptation he resisted with ease was the temptation to nepotism. Now I've alluded to his interest in the saints. Peter Hebblethwaite, the author of The Definitive Life of Roncalli in English, once made what I thought was a brilliant observation. He said that Roncalli scrupulously observed the reforms of Trent not by observing their canons abstractly understood, but by using as his personal example, the life and pastoral activities of the great Tridentine reformer, um, St. Charles Borromeo, died in 1584. I think that's quite right. Roncalli, a well-read historian, actually published a lot on um, Charles Borromeo's visits in, um, in Bergamo, um, 
A profound reader of spiritual texts always had before him saintly figures who combined deep spiritual gifts with a persistent sense of pastoral duties. There's a telling passage in his spiritual journal that is so apropos of this point that it deserves citation. It's from his early days in Rome as a seminary student. Quote, I used to call to mind the image of some saint whom I set myself to imitate down to the smallest detail as a painter makes an exact copy of a Raphael painting. I used to say to myself, in this case, St. Aloysius, for example, would have done so and so. He would have th uh, done this or that. He would have turned down that and so on and so forth. It turned out, however, that I was never able to achieve what I thought I could do, and this worried me. The method was wrong. From the saints, one must, and here he underlines the next few words, take the substance, not the accidents of their virtues. I must not be the dry, bloodless reproduction of a model, however perfect. That's an excellent truth set down by a young person. It is not unlike the advice with which Francis de Sales, another of his favorite authors, begins the introduction to the devout life, written for a young married woman. When he argued to his presumed recipient that she had no business drawing up a plan for the devout life by imitating monks, one requires the gift for seeing virtue and spirituality incarnated in a particular life and drawing its essence as far as applicable from one's own place in life. To do that is to exercise what the Ignatian tradition, which he knew so very well, called the discernment of spirits. To adjudicate both the consolations and the desolations that comes to one in prayer in the process of a Caesus. Half page and I'm done. Those that endure to the end will be saved. <laughs> Stick with me. One could make a good argument for saying that his actions in the short five years of his papacy were motivated by this simple perception, that he was to the core a pastoral priest whose experience, refracted through the life of prayer, derived from his desire to model sanctity as could be seen in his concrete position as Bishop of Rome, pastor of the whole church. His piety is not our piety, but the most fundamental instincts were quite sound. As he himself once noted, what nourished him for over 60 years was sacred scripture, the Roman Missal, the readings from the breviary, and classical resources drawn from Thomas Akempis, Bossuet, Francis de Sales, etc. Those sources have nourished all the great saints, just as they have nourished and sustained him through a long life in the service of Christ and the Christian community. Thank you all very much.